Hello and welcome back to Irish Football Fan TV. Today we're here with Kieran McIver, who is a Shelburne Under 12s coach and a former colleague of mine. We used to coach together in the USA. He also writes for Heavy Bag Boxing, which you can check out in the link in the bio. Uh, we're just going to talk a little bit since we coached in the US together. That's right. About the, the demise, I suppose, of the US national team. <laughs> um, obviously, well, what do you think? It was kind of bring it straight into. The kind of tr transition from uh, Jorgen Klinsmann to Bruce Arena. Yeah. What are your thoughts on that? Well, I think that um, Jorgen Klinsmann, realistically, like when he came in, I think he came in pretty much to change whole coaching structure. Yeah. That was basically his job. Like, and I think I don't think he should have been the manager. He probably should have been the director of football. Really, that should have been, and then he could have been in the backdrop while someone else was running the team. Because yeah. he was getting a lot of stick because he did he changed a lot of things in the coaching. Um, licensing so basically your USSFA which is like UEFA A a UEFA A takes a year to do back then before he came to America USSF was one week so you're basically as qualified as UEFA A coach but you've done one week course with UEFA you're learning on yeah. the top top coaches so he changed all of that and made it more in line with FIFA and more professional you know so um, so really then he was kind of like a deer in headlights and Bruce Arena came in who was, who was with the team before that yeah, he'd been there a few years, and he, and he was with LA Galaxy as well. So know a lot of the players from that as well, and he would have worked with some kind of high caliber guys, the likes of Beckham and that. Yeah. Uh, and Keno, obviously, as well. And yeah. Donovan. Yeah. It's tough because the, the, the squad that he has, like they're trying to develop players at the younger age groups, but he, Klinsman he didn't have that time to do that, so he was going to Germany and these places trying to get players who had American backgrounds. Yeah. yeah, and... Uh, you're trying to pull him in and then Bruce Arena came in and tried to change it then like you look at the squad like a lot of it's on his last legs um, and Tim uh, Howard's getting the game from yeah yeah <laughs> Tim Howard Bradley his, his time came three seasons ago yeah yeah Four team. I mean, good servants don't get me wrong but uh, I felt like it's, it's his time as a top class keeper I finished about three years ago yeah I think should really like just in my opinion they probably should just strip down the whole team and take away all the older players your Tim Howard's, your Bradley's, um, Clint Dempsey's. I know Clint Dempsey hasn't really been playing. He's kind of... Yeah, but he's on his last legs as well. Like, yeah. He's playing for the Sounders still, is he? Yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, and they're not doing too like that great as they used to be anyway, so... No, no. He's getting older every year. He must be about 34 now, is he? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah, he's easy on that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, they're relying on these players. The way they used to rely on, on Donovan a lot as well. Oh, yeah. yeah he was heavily, a big one. Heavily... You know, relied on him. Most like we did with Robbie Keane for a number of years. <laughs> <laughs> but the issue with, with Landon Donovan was, you know, Klinsman, I think one of the reasons why he didn't bring him to the World Cup the last time, the Americans were upset by that. Yeah. But they asked, like, Klinsman had approached him and told him, you know, um, why don't you go to the Open Challenge yourself and then you'll be cemented in the team all the time. But he didn't want to do that. He wanted to be a big fish in a small pond. And people used to come up to him and go, I, I saw him score two goals for the Galaxy last week, he's doing well. But he'd be like, he's not really, he's playing at 70% of his potential. Like, he, why isn't he going to be open and pushing himself? Yeah, well, Everton were obviously chasing him for a number of years, and the fans mm -hmm. really wanted him and warmed to him, because he came on loan, obviously, twice to Everton. Mm -hmm. And done very well. I know it didn't really work out for him in Germany, when he first went there. But when he came to Everton, like, he was brilliant. Like, I, yeah. I, I seen him, I was over at Everton Man City. Mm -hmm. And Everton won one nil, and he was playing that night, and it was one of his kind of first couple of games because he obviously had signed, um, in January, mm. and it was it was the deadline day that day, so it was the thirty first. So he'd been playing a couple of games before that, but he was brilliant, yeah, brilliant that day. And he was very hard working. He was playing on the on the right wing for us. Yeah, yeah, and that's why it's so disappointing though when he was off the six month contract, he didn't take it because like surely if you're taking that contract, you're gonna cement your place in the national team like you're playing yeah. in the Premier League regularly. So there's no, there's no question there, like, you know, was you're playing LA Galaxy. Well, he, he claimed that he wanted to promote the league over there, didn't he? Yeah. So yeah, that, was, yeah. that was his, I suppose, his uh, excuse, I would say. Yeah. yeah. But you're going to play with David Beckham, a team where he's 35, 36. Beckham's gone at this point. He's gone, was yeah, he? PSG or something. Even he went back and challenged yeah. himself again. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? That's but, uh, right, that's right, yeah. Do you think maybe there's a, there's a problem with the youth setup? Or do you think they pay to play is becoming a big problem over there? Yeah, uh, well, that's, it has to hinder it. Like, I think when when you create yeah, for, you, for for people that don't know what pay to play is, would you, would you like to? Yeah, yeah. So pay to play is basically um, 
in America, um, it would if a lot of kids when they pay to play, basically, you know, they're paying a lot of money to play to play soccer. You know, basically, if you are in, if you want to play for an academy, let's just say, um, like a Premier team, Premier, um, some kids will pay up to two grand for a season, like, um, and that's for professional coaching. So that's obviously to pay for the the coaches' wages, yeah. kits, all these. But things. also involves a lot of travelling as well. Yeah, a lot of travelling involved. You know, so you could be into the 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 fill yeah, the schedule hours away. Yeah. Oh, like you could be in your hands. Yeah. You know, travelling. It wasn't. It wasn't. A, well, it was a nice drive for us because because <laughs> yeah. it, it wasn't. Uh, you know, shitty fields, like, <laughs> driving down the country and stuff like that. Do you know what I mean? It was actually nice scenery that you would see over there. I suppose. Yeah. So, but the issue was that um, because you you create that t- type of setup. Kids that can't afford to pay that type of money don't get to play in those yeah, Premier like teams street, or street soccer. Yeah, yeah. Kids, yeah. Um, because obviously it's not that environment. American kids aren't doing that, and their schedules are full. So really, it becomes an upper class sport then. So really, even though America have created these like uh, training yeah, centers, that's a good point, yeah. yeah. Even though they've created these training centers when uh, kids are coming from these academies and then going to play under U.S. coaches. They're still coming from those Premier teams of upper class, you know, upper class um, citizens. So it's really difficult. Then, if you're some like a Hispanic kid or something like that, and you've got great potential, if you can't afford to pay, then you're not going to play. Whereas if you look at in Shelburne, like we have, like the kids, the kids, they pay a few subs and things like that, but they're not they're not paying anything even close to what yeah, American definitely. kids are paying. Facilities are a lot better over there, though. Oh yeah, oh, yeah. yeah there's no doubt about that. The facilities, the the, co- the coaches can make a living off coaching, and they make good money off coaching. So then that is their profession they provide. So they get very good coaching, like no doubt about it. But there has to be something question there about if if you're paying that much money, you're traveling around the place and all these different kits and stuff like that. It's only you almost feel like you have made it. Do you know yeah. what I mean? So the, the desire isn't there. Whereas with our kids, you know, because we're, I'm a lot of us aren't really getting paid. Um, unless you're the highest highest level, and yeah. um, the kids aren't getting paid, yeah. So you don't have the time for that. So basically, if if you're not good enough, you're not putting your weight, you're not going to be here next season. Like the chances are, like our my younger sons will probably move up next year. They probably will, two of them probably won't be playing. Do you know what I mean, maybe maybe two three players. You just have depends how high of a standard it is. Yeah. If they don't commit and uh, up their game, then you have to let them go. Not because. Um, there's resentment there. It's just because you don't want to kill out of his depth. Do you know what I mean? So, whereas in America, if you've paid, doesn't you matter. Still play, yeah. yeah, we'll just put you another yeah, team. That's a bit of a. a yeah, yeah. Do you not think that's a bit uh, like fair though? Because I mean, if you're paying your money, you obviously mm-hmm. want to get game time. But surely they should say before you pay the money that you know, it should be stated that if you're gonna, mm-hmm. if you're if you're going to sign up, that you will get game time. Yeah. Because otherwise, you might as well go to a team that are struggling and try yeah. to help them so you get more time on the ball Like, it, it, it's more important for kids to, to get touches and that's what they're trying to do obviously we'll, we'll get into obviously the difference between the structure uh, between our game and, uh, and uh, the US game mm. uh, but like the way it is over here is it's like I noticed that they're, they're starting to bring this new thing in where they'll have if there's a team and they have like four different teams so they'll like review the kids how their development's going if it's, if, if it's the case we're in the top bracket and they're not really doing so well they'll move them down a level so they'll get more game time and more touches on the ball which mm. I think is very good but what you're saying there is that if they're, they're, they're paying and still playing but sometimes they're out of their depth that can dent their confidence massively mm. and some of them will probably want to give it up then you know yeah well the, the issue is like so for a perfect example is being in, in those uh, Premier Academy, it's basically. It's damn good team. <laughs> so basically, yeah, uh, one day it should be in the Premier Academy. So we would have trials every every summer. Of course, yeah. But the thing is, you would have so many kids terms. So you could have eighty or hundred, right? But it's a league academy, so really, you should only have one elite team and maybe a, a second. Of course, team. yeah, yeah. So. Well, that's what I'm saying. Is yeah, it can yeah. differentiate. So if the player's not doing so well, uh, in one like. Can you move them in and out? Exactly, yeah. So we could do that or we double rocks of them. Yeah, that's what you're saying. But the issue is because there's 80 kids and they're paying, we wouldn't, you, a lot of clubs wouldn't turn away 50 of the kids. They would take all of them. The money, yeah. And then you've, for, it's supposed to be Premier Academy go, though, so then your bottom team is no better than a local, like, recreational team. You yeah. know what I mean? But because they're paying, they're wearing the badge and that, and then they get to tell people that I'm in 
so and so Premier Academy and things like that. So that that's a massive issue then, like you know, because yeah. um, you're not trying to create elite footballers, then you're just basically a business. It, it like it really is a business over there, yeah. like, you know. And some people might disagree with me who's over there. If you There's disagree it. with you, I leave your comments. But. <laughs> I mean, people who who maybe live over there and yeah, um, who are in smaller it. clubs and things like that. That's fair enough, like because I have been in smaller clubs where it's not like that. But as you, yeah, definitely when it gets to higher levels, it really is a business. Like tournaments and things like that, ridiculous. Yeah, like absolutely. Like, you're paying like massive amounts of money for kids to play three or four games a day, and uh, like I know people say it's great for competition and fitness and all that, but like the risk of injury and fatigue and things like that is just mad to me like like kids paying an 80 degree heat yeah for five six hours a day just doesn't make sense to me like you know it's just a business it's all about money and the thing is how can they how how they can make money yeah it should be about the player yeah not about the um because you're trying to develop these players it should be about the players not you know Mm. you know what you want your best players training against the best players that they can possibly come up against not weaker players Mm. And then if it's a case if you have your weaker players on the second team and they want to come in and try and get better, get them to train with the better players. Mm. That's the way it should be. Yeah. Not be throwing people of all different levels in with, you know, then you're, not, you're never really going to find out who is the best. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? And very much in Ireland, like, it's real cutthroat in terms of turning pro. Like, the, the cream always rises to the top, like, so um, every year you're trying to make the cut, that's it. And then you're not gonna you're going to play or you're not going to play, like. Where there's never that danger when you. If I pay the money, and I'm in the, I'm in the squad, or I'm in the club. I'm always going to wear the badge and play for the club. Uh, if that's the way it is. Whereas, with a League of Ireland team, obviously with local teams like this club here, my local club, obviously it's not. It's a different agenda. Everyone's trying to locally just play football. Um, still with the hope of but still one, competitively one get or something. Yeah, 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 yeah still competitively. Um, so, but then in, in, in like shells, for instance, each year you're trying to make the cut. If it's not good enough, then you're dropped off. That's really it. But that's the, the the issue with the states. You're always going to be in a, in a team if you pay them. Yeah, money. but if you look at that, like a, like a, like like look at Roy Keane, for example. Like he yeah. was told he wasn't good enough. He was too small. He was this, that, and the other. So he got knocked back, and then he went and proved himself. He just kept trying and trying different things. And then eventually mm-hmm. got the call up with Nottingham Forest. So that's an example. So if you're not turning these players away, to give some some players need that to get themselves to make themselves that much better, they need rejection. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Maybe yeah. they're not getting that, and that's why. Ah, oh, well, I'll just turn up. I'll still get my game. Yeah. You know, so. Well, most pros will tell you that when they retire, they say there's more there's more disappointments and rejection when you're trying to make it as a footballer than success. They'll always tell you there's loads of disappointments. Like, but I don't think. A lot of kids are hearing that now these days. You know what I mean? They're not getting told that they're not good enough and things like that, and it's it's difficult for them to to handle. Yeah. You know? um, too sensitive these days. Man. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, do, 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 so you on. But you were talking about like, um, you know, you don't want different players, different levels playing against each other and things like that. Well, know? I just feel like players yeah. at certain levels should be playing and they start getting better and better and bring them in mm. rightly so, almost like a trial. And see how they handle it with the bigger players. And if they get better, but they'll only get better by playing with better players. Do you know what mm. I mean? But once they're at an established level where they're getting like like a lot of touches on the ball, so they get confident with the ball and stuff like that, and then they're able to take that into, you know, playing with bigger players or better players, or better coaches and stuff like that. So yeah, that's what I'm saying. Effectively, like go down, drop down if you need to, and then come up when the time's right. You know, go down, do your part, and then come back up. That's yeah, basically what I meant. Yeah, so you're developing at your own steady rate. Yeah, um, some players, some players develop later than others, you know. Yeah, and that's why I think that it's a business over there because yeah. you turn up to tournaments and uh, everyone pays a lot of money. But the thing is, they would rarely screen you. Like if the club, if the club that's running this tournament doesn't know you or can't assess the leagues that you are in, so you could be from, let's say Boston, but I'm from Rhode Island, and another team's from. Connecticut, yeah, they're not gonna know how good you are. So what happens is you turn to this tournament and they just throw you into these different groups, and you could get humped every <coughs> game, or you could hump someone the whole yeah. weekend, and uh, like you, you, you've learned nothing. And so, it, it can be unfair on some of the kids, especially if you travel all that way to get, you know, smashed. Yeah, yeah. It's not, it's not, it's not enjoyable. Yeah, like a, being a coach and haven't seen it, 
and the, the disappointment of the kids you know what I mean so it might be the thing that turns them away from playing it you know yeah. and then you have the parents screaming on the sideline on top of that yeah, oh jeez don't get me started so, on the parents but we won't go into that <laughs> but do you think there's much of a difference in the structure between the Irish setup now obviously you're, you're, you're involved with grassroots level and then say the American grassroots like is there much of a difference there? Or? Oh, yeah, it's night and day, like, completely night, night and day, in terms of the, like, just the the, the environment that the, the kids that I've coached in America, that they're growing up in, a lot of them um, are playing multiple, multiple sports, you know, they've got lacrosse, they're playing baseball, they're playing soccer and all these things. So the desire to go after one isn't like a kid that I would maybe be coaching a grassroots here who's maybe only playing Gaelic, or soccer and they're going to pick one of the two and then yeah. they're going to go with it so they're either going to play county level or they're going to try to turn pro in football so the desire is very different like the kid, some of the kids I coach in soccer in America I would you know obviously you encourage practicing and things like that but the kids who would literally tell you like I, I don't have enough time I literally have no time because their their schedules are so jammed with extracurricular activities and all these different things you yeah. know so it's just a different culture, it's a different environment, you know. Um, but still, like obviously, like top base baseball, basketball players, and all that grew up in that environment, so it can't be all that bad. Like of course, yeah. When you, but you you do need to be if you want to reach the 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 pinnacle, you know, and get get to there. You you need to say right. Well, I need to focus on this sport and this sport and all. If that's the way, if they want to evolve as a, as a country, because it's weird because there's been such a you know, with the MLS and stuff like that, there's been such a, a rise in the number of kids that will want to play it now. But the mm. thing is, beforehand they've been doing well in tournaments and getting to tournaments and actually, you know, doing all, doing pretty well. And whereas now they're not in it, and it, it's kind of it's it's kind of a knockback for them, I believe. Oh yeah, yeah, big time. Because obviously they've had all they bought all the rights for the World Cup and things like that, and Fox have sorry. So now the US team isn't in it. Um, it's not. It's not the end of the world, like because people are still gonna watch it. But it's a knockback in terms of they've made so many changes in the coaching structure that now for them to not qualify, it's kind of like, oh wait, are we actually doing it wrong? And do we have to go strip it down and go back over it again? Which I don't think they will. Like they're gonna. I don't think they'll strip it down completely. But sure, no. if they do, I mean, you look at Germany. It didn't work out too badly for them, did it? No, no, no. But you have to do that. You have to go through that kind of rough patch at the start where... It's like everything. A lot of teams would go through transition. Like, you look at Man United now. Mm. I mean, they're not... They're, like, they're only getting back to to near what, what they used to be at the moment. And it's taken mm. three, four years, maybe five even. Yeah. You know, mm. so... Every team goes through. Barcelona went through it. Real Madrid went through it as well. So, like, every big team goes through it. Arsenal probably... Well, they've been going through for about <laughs> 10 years now. <laughs> they may be back one day, who knows. But do you, you know what I mean? Yeah. It, it, with good things, transition has to happen and, and you have to rebuild. Like, you know, you, you can not you can have a good team for a certain amount of time, but there's going to be a time where they get past the mm. age and you have to, you know, cut them, out, cut them out, bring new blood in. Yeah, yeah. Barcelona did it really well when they, when they got rid of Ronaldinho, brought in Messi and the likes of that. Do you know mm. what I mean? They, they knew the time was right. That was the transition, but they didn't wait too long. They didn't wait for Ronaldinho to get over the hill, and then yeah. bring Messi in. They knew when the time was right to kind of bring him in and yeah. look at the success. Then obviously they've had yeah, like, like even that, that yeah that time was the league they won with Ronaldinho in two thousand six. Like Messi, if he wasn't injured, he would have played now. So yeah. it, was, it was the perfect transition. Yeah. And then you look at like obviously Germany. I mean, it was always working really well for them. And you look at the amount of top class players that they've produced since then. Like, mm. you look at the moment, like some of the players that they have. They've got uh, Julian Brandt at Leverkusen. They've got uh, Leroy Sané at City. Some of these have uh, Timo Werner as well. All these top class players coming through. And and you look at the ones that have been there over the last couple of seasons. Your likes of your your Kadiras, your Ozils, all these type of players who all kind of came in together with Joachim Love and you know. Mm. Yeah. I don't think it's all that bad for the USA. I think you know no. they've they've got <laughs> they've got the uh, population. You know they just need to re- work a bit harder on where they're getting these players from. And, and yeah. I, I, know, I think the MLS would be a, a key thing as well. So it seems to be having a lot of money going in there. And you know having those, like, you would have thought that having the likes of Perlos and the David Villas and stuff like that mm. would have would have brought more because it's obviously added quality in the league. I know they're 
catching mm-hmm. on a bit but even still yeah. their experience passing on to other players training with them every day you know mm-hmm. you can still see Perlos different, different oh yeah players. and Kaka as well like, yeah. Yeah. like but um, I was just going to touch on MLS like MLS what they're trying to do is they're trying to create apparently it's a second division because what's wrong is because it's only one division yeah it's just a franchise yeah so halfway through the season if you can't win the league or anything like that you're not going to get relegated so the tail end of the season is just a lot of really un- uncompetitive games because nothing's going to happen friendlies to almost yeah. yeah you know what I mean so it's it's not really competitive in that sense you know yeah. but, um, and but that's what makes the league obviously over over here and over in England that much better because it's competitive you're fighting to stay up you're fighting for your club you're, yeah. it could be a hometown club or whatever for for you know yeah and staying time. up means millions like you could go under if you don't stay up and whereas the MLS is overall the clubs do you know what I mean so exactly. you, you when you sign for a club in America you're not signing for the club you're signing for the MLS and then they handpick you and put you where they where they want to put you you know what I mean and then you go into the draft and everything's very equal you know so there's no fighting for this and that and you know it's Premier League is just really competitive you're literally fighting for your survival every game's competitive in the Premier League though yeah exactly yeah but that, I think that's what makes it the hardest league in the world like if you look yeah. at it you, you, if you're a gambling man, you, you know, you could be messed about. Some teams can look at Crystal Palace beating Chelsea, like, you know. Yeah. Mark Hughes was saying how pe- when people say, like, oh, you have to bring through youth and things like that, he thinks that's really disingenuous because he said that you've no idea, like, boards are on your back to finish as high as you can because literally between, if I finish 10th but I finish 8th, there's literally, like, almost 10 million in the difference. So you can't even bring on a young fella for the last 10 minutes because you're thinking oh we need this draw yeah, like this it win be, yeah. yeah just to finish 8th you know because it's worth so much money so it's it's so difficult like. yeah so obviously like yeah well, there's not really we could do like do about that like obviously the fans would like to see younger players being brought in and obviously if it's costing the club millions they're not going to do it but at the same time like how, how do you find the balance there you know but I suppose we leave that up to the guys can tell us in the comments uh, what, how they feel about that or if they agree or disagree with us but uh, anyway uh, just quickly touch on uh, your recent success there obviously with your, with your number 12s yeah yeah no what the, the 12s are doing well you know it's me and this fella Keith uh, Coleman uh, coach with them and uh, they so we did tournament uh, midway through the season which is uh, Albion Rovers local team Albion Rovers um Eddie Marathon. Yeah, shout out, yeah. And uh, we, we won that. Um then basically we so we're in DDSL major one. So it's the third third division DDSL. And uh we are in the cup for DDSL major and major one. So basically pre- DDSL Premier would be the highest level in Ireland, like that'd be the your Saint your Kevin's, you know, your Belvedere's and stuff like that. So we basically won the DDSL Major Cup, so we we beat all teams in the division above us. We we finished uh, that cup uh, against Joey's. We beat them one nil. Mm, it was a really tight game. Like um, the lads did really well. You know, the league that we played in, like we essentially won it yesterday. We played Luke in a way. Uh, so basically, the the team behind us can only finish in the same amount of points. So and we have three more games. So. But the, the season hasn't been that competitive in the league. You know, that even when the lads are playing poorly, they're still they're still winning games. Yeah. So as long as we can jump up, with, there was talks of us possibly going up straight to Premier. Um, Did that be too much of a jump right Yeah, right yeah, now. yeah. Like the DDSL were, were going to offer us the Premier position and go up. But it's it's a really tough league. Like, like literally the, the best kids in Ireland are playing in Cavins and Balbo and yeah. the home teams. Like, so... Um, We'll probably go up to major, and um, we we'll probably like we would probably challenge to, in the top two for the major when we go up, um, because we've beaten the, all teams top three up there. The home farm, we'd be Joey's, we'd be Cabin Tealy, um. So it seems uh, to be a good uh, a good time to be a Shells fan at the moment. And then <laughs> we obviously won the Leinster senior cup there. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Against Dundalk, yeah. Mm. It's even bigger, better for me, you know. Yeah. Against the town, you know. But uh, yeah, yeah so yeah, 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 so we'll see how that goes. Like, the, the, the lads are going to go up to Lambie Lab next year. And, Good. Yeah. Um, so yeah, um, happy days. And then just obviously with your your heavy bag boxing, yeah. how did you kind of come into that category? 
Um, well, I've, I've boxed for a good few years, um, and I've always just loved boxing. But I was basically on Twitter one day, this fella for heavyweight boxing was putting up this post, and I basically just gave my opinion on something in boxing, just related to the article. And uh, basically reached out to each other after that, and he said, "Would you like to write articles for us and stuff?" So I did. Um, loved it. Um, did so did one on weight cutting. One on Manny Pacquiao. I had to cover a little bit. Of and, the, uh, did, did you get some Twitter action? Who were you tweeting? Yeah, so the weight cutting one, uh, Pauli Manaji retweeted it. Um, he, he said it was the Where's most. Where's your one balls, One. <laughs> He said it was one of the most accurate articles you read. Blah blah blah. You know, great. Yeah. yeah. The USA fans. Then, yeah. So basically, because he retweeted it, then I it, it, it's the article itself had like something like 100, 100, 150 retweets. Like, is that article um, still up? Still up. Yeah. yeah so you can check it out. Yeah. And then a few weeks later, I released one on Manny Pacquiao about the Floyd Mayweather fight and things. I, it, my own opinions and facts that they put into it about. Um, boxers moving up eight different weight classes and not basically slowing down in any form of any way. There's loads of facts in the article, but basically he had spoken about the article himself. He retweeted it because he, in many interviews, had spoken about how he thought that Manny Pacquiao was um, not a clean for her, basically, for yeah. it that way. Like, and he retweeted it. And then I got like these all these messages in my inbox, like just from people I'd never met in my life. Just like you probably get some more now after this video. Yeah, it's just like <laughs> oh, it's mad. And then um, so yeah, so he he was saying that way. He retweeted a few of my my things. I met him once as well. Like he he really nice, really nice man. Like and I was saying to you before, I said it was really funny because I was I was a huge fan of him for years in boxing, well before anyone. I knew don't him. like him now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because no one knew him, not like Team no one knew him. yeah. <laughs> because no one knew him for years, so I was I look like he's he's the best he's the best boxing opponent in the world. Like he, people, if you know boxing, um, before yeah, I know I know Floyd Mayweather, I think he's very highly as a as a pundit. So. Yeah, yeah. So but um, so yeah, I be, I basically I mean, it was a lovely lad like and all that, and it was just so, it was such a coincidence then when the whole McGregor thing happened because I'm a huge McGregor fan as well. I just happened to do them a span. Yeah, yeah. I thought it was brilliant. Like I thought it was class and then obviously what happened what happened. But um yeah, so uh essentially then um now everyone hates uh my favourite boxer, like so, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, it's just one of those, isn't it? I suppose well uh, over to you guys I suppose with that one uh Thanks very much for coming on the show, Kieran. And uh, right. thanks for do, having me. Do check out Heavy Bag Boxing and uh yeah, tell us your thoughts about the US national team and uh, how you think shells are going to do going forward or anything you like. Just uh, leave a comment. Don't forget to subscribe. We're nearly at 600. Uh, we're at 500 last week. So, yeah, thanks very much for watching Irish Football Fan TV. Have a great day.